Whispers in the Trees is a dark podcast currently focusing on the Great White North, surrounding all of the grisly truths from the kindest place on earth to the head-scratching unknowns hidden beneath the snow. My name is Mads and join me on my journey today into the mysteries and murders along Highway 16, later connecting to Highway 5 and Highway 97. Today's case will include racism, murder, violence, kidnapping, sexual assault, and strong language. Viewer discretion is advised. Now, join me around the campfire, if you dare, as I tell the true story of the Highway of Tears. From 1989 to 2006, nine women were found murdered on the 726-kilometer, or 451-mile-long stretch of Highway 16. In this podcast, I will be discussing them in the order that they were found or that they were murdered. Um, This is a really complicated case. There are a lot of dates. There's a lot of names. More so, a lot of dates and a lot of places. So if you actually follow on my YouTube, I will try and map it out and visualize it as much as I can because honestly, I tried doing it separately in an event timeline the way it came out in the news, but it really just got so muddled so fast and so easily. So listed in order. Our first was a mother, Gloria Moody. She was found October 26th. 1969 and she had gone missing in Williams Lake BC and the day before she had been on a weekend road trip with family. She was found by hunters on a cattle trail 10 kilometers away from town. She had bled to death after she was beaten and sexually assaulted. Next we have Micheline Pear, 18 years old and last seen in Fort St. John area of BC on July 1970 and she was found on August 8th near Hudson's Hope by some berry pickers. She was also beaten to death with a blunt weapon. Next is Gail Wace from Clearwater, also from BC, and she was last seen hitchhiking in October of 1973. She was 19 years old when her remains were recovered and her clothing never was. There was evidence against a man named Bobby Jack Fowler who was an American-born serial murderer and rapist who was a transient construction worker. He traveled all over North America working on construction work, obviously, and as a monster stealing lives. There was enough to connect him to her death, but there was not enough for an actual conviction. So after Gail, there was 19-year-old Pamela Darlington. She was found face down in a river of a local park of her hometown in Kamloops, BC. This was in November of also 1973. She was last seen in the company of a blonde male in a bar that was never identified. She is also believed to have been the victim of Bobby Jack Fowler, but that has yet to be proven. And to be honest, uh, Bobby Jack Fowler is a brunette. She was last seen with a blonde male. So we will see how that goes. Next was 14-year-old Monica Ignis, who was last seen walking along Highway 16 near Thornhill, just outside of Terrace, BC. This was in December of 1974, but her remains were found a few kilometers east from where she was last seen four months later. She was strangled to death. She was dressed, but one sock was missing, which would lead me, personally, to believe she was either redressed or that this sock was taken as a trophy, possibly both. Colleen McMillan was said to be a sweet, shy, and loving 16-year-old girl when she left her family home in Lac La Hache, BC, hitchhiking to visit her friend in August 1974. She was last seen leaving her home before her remains were found a month later. In October of 2012, 38 years after her remains were discovered, DNA evidence was found that led the RCMP to announce that Bobby Jack Fowler had, in fact, killed Colleen. It was this discovery that linked him to Pamela Darlington and Gail Ways as well. Unfortunately, or fortunately, however you choose to look at it, Bobby Jack Fowler died in 2006. 
So we will never hear why he did this to Colleen, and we will never get a confession about if he did it to the other two beautiful girls before her. Monica Jack is remembered as a beautiful little girl with a distinctive laugh. She was deeply loved by her family and was the youngest victim added to the Epana file at only 12. She disappeared in 1978 while riding her bike just outside of Merritt, BC, and her remains were recovered in 1996. 1996. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled before her clothes, later revealed, were burned at the same time as part of her body. In 2014, a man named Gary Taylor Handlin was brought to court for her death, as well as the death of another 11-year-old girl that was unrelated to the Highway of Tears. Gary has adamantly denied his involvement in the death of Monica despite this conviction. RCMP officers claimed he confessed to an undercover officer prior to his arrest. He was found guilty and convicted in 2019. Maureen Mosey was last seen hitchhiking outside of Salmon Arm, B.C. on May 8, 1981. Her body was found in a runoff lane that led to Highway 97 shortly after her disappearance. She was 33 and last seen entering a car with a man described to be in his late 20s or early 30s with black or brown hair and a beard. Maureen was said to have been wearing moccasins and had a beaded canvas bag when she was last seen, which honestly could have been part of why she was particularly targeted at this time. Shelly Baxu was said to be one of those girls that could light up an entire room just by walking in. She loved life and she loved people and according to her mother, she was incredibly trusting of everyone, which could have been why she, she was a target. She was last seen in Hinton, Alberta, and she is the only case on the Highway of Tears to actually disappear in Alberta. Of the confirmed cases in the file, one of the women is from Alberta, but she disappeared in BC. Shelley is the only one who disappeared in Alberta. She disappeared on May 3rd, 1983 by Highway 16. Her remains were never recovered, and she was 16 years old when she disappeared. Her student card, jacket, bra, and pantyhose were later found scattered along the highway. 24-year-old Alberta Williams disappeared in August 1989. She and her sister had been at a bar when her sister looked away to talk to her boyfriend before turning back and Alberta was gone. Witnesses say they saw Alberta climb into a vehicle with her quote-unquote Uncle Jack and another non-native man. Her naked remains were found several weeks later in Prince Rupert, BC. She was abducted, sexually assaulted, and murdered. When investigators questioned Jack, a man that others had described as someone who had been incredibly close to Alberta, and open and friendly, and someone they really liked to talk to, when the investigators came to him, he was closed off and reserved in giving information. This could have been due to the fact that these are Indigenous people, this is an Indigenous community, and some of them don't have the healthiest view of the government, given the uh, residential schools covered in one of my last videos. Um, so he might not have had the best view of the police. So this could have been why he was closed off with them, but if he had been as close to Alberta as everyone was saying, Everyone was saying that the two of them were like two peas in a pod. Would he not want all of the help that he could possibly get to bring his niece home? It's just a little suspicious to me, but I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm just a voice on the internet. Delphine Nickel it disappeared on June 14th, 1990. She was hitchhiking along Highway 16 as she tried to get from Smithers to her home in Telqua, BC. She was 16 when she went missing and her remains were never recovered. This is a side note, but I can't imagine this. Delphine's disappearance came only a year after the murder of her cousin. This is an unconnected case. And then a few years later, another cousin would also disappear. I cannot imagine the pain that this family would have gone through. Maybe because it's a family case, 
maybe they were connected but honestly it was never officially done um so to my knowledge it was just um two separate cases and then delphine is part of the highway 16. next victim was also only 16 years old ramona wilson was her mother's miracle child her mother had been told she could no longer conceive and then suddenly she fell pregnant with ramona she had just left her ex-husband that she had a couple other kids with and she wanted to have another baby with her new boyfriend and she desperately tried and suddenly she did she had ramona she was always so grateful for this little girl and she adored her she was loved so deeply she has four siblings that's what it was she has four half siblings and she was close to all of them but she was particularly close to her sister brenda there was an 11 year age gap but brenda always talked very fondly of her sister and how her sister would come over and help out as much as she could babysitting and just trying to give her sister a break when she could she really was close it's very sad that this young lady was taken it's very sad that all of them were taken ramona was hitchhiking she was trying to get to smithers as well she went missing on highway 16. she disappeared on june 11 1994 and her remains were recovered in april 1995 near the airport in smithers next is 15 year old roxanne tiara tiara possibly i'm sorry i'm so bad with names i'm trying her mom remembers her as a really good kid a happy bubbly kid when she was a kid when she became a teenager she began to hang out with a rough crowd and that's when the problems started when she was 12 she was incarcerated for an unknown petty offense and her brother-in-law described her as just this sweet innocent little child in the detention center and when she was released she apparently just went wild she left their hometown of quinnell and she moved to salmon arm on her own engaging in drugs and what is known as survival sex this is a high this is a high risk form of sex trafficking to survive uh, usually to get money just so that they can live out there she would often visit her family when she could and in 1994 she told her mother she wanted to go to rehab and kick her addictions she was ready to move past this part of her life and she never got the chance she disappeared in november of 1994 and her remains were found near burns lake off of highway 16. please understand that i am not victim blaming i am trying to explain the truth of roxanne's situation so it can be understood she was a kid who fell into a trap like so many others she fell into a world of drugs like so many kids around the world she was just a kid she was 12 when she was first thrown into prison and ran with a rough crowd she was ready to pull herself free she was so strong and she was actually last seen by her family leaving their home to go check into her rehab facility she was so ready and she tried for her second chance and it was ripped away from her it is unfair just like it is unfair for all of these women next on the list is alicia germain also 15 when she disappeared she was actually a friend of roxanne's the two girls had met in the lifestyle of drugs and survival sex they leaned on each other very heavily when they were when they were around each other she'd run away from home when she was also 12 following her parents divorce and her mom remembers her as being soft and sensitive only putting up a really hard tough shell because she was trying to protect herself but underneath she still had this really soft sensitive side to her she just tried to be tough and independent so that she could make it in um, foster care and the life on the streets that she had because it was hard for her to fit into foster homes because of the shell that she put on uh, she would come to her mom to try and turn her life around later on explaining that she would go back to school to complete her high school education and she wanted to kick the drug habit she was at that same point that roxanne was at she did not get the chance either it's really really sad her remains were recovered by 
an elementary school on the west side of Highway 16 on December 9, 1994. She was stabbed to death. Yikes, I kind of feel bad for those kids who found that body. I hope it wasn't kids, but it was an elementary school, so I really just hope it was someone walking their dog on the grounds on a weekend or something. Lana Derrick was 19 and the next unfortunate soul. She was a smart young woman and a student at the Northwest Community College in Houston, BC. She was enrolled in their forestry program. She was known to make friends quickly and she was a bright young girl who took her studies seriously. She would go home on weekends to visit family and it was on one of those trips. The weekend before Thanksgiving, that would be her very last one. Lana was last seen by her sister picking up some cash that her father had given her to give to Lana at 3 a.m. before Lana headed out to a party. She disappeared on October 7th, 1995. She was 19 when she was last seen near Terrace, B.C. Thornhill, to be exact. Huh. Familiar. She was traveling east on Highway 16 trying to get home, which was in the Hazelton area. Nicole Hoare was originally from Alberta, but was working in Prince George when she went missing. She was last seen June 21st, 2002 on West Highway 16, hitchhiking from Prince George to Smithers. She disappeared at age 25 and her remains were never recovered. She was the first of the victims to get widespread media coverage being featured in The Globe, Vancouver Sun, and Edmonton Journal. Before Nicole, who was a Caucasian woman, They'd really just been trying to sweep these under the rug. There wasn't supposedly a problem, which is really sad, but so on and so forth. The first original girls, this is going to be a sidetrack. I'll get to the rest of the victims in a second, but I need to make a point. The first nine victims added to the file were, eight of them were indigenous. One of them was not. And then of the 18 that would be confirmed later on, 10 of them would be. So 10 out of 18, but originally 8 out of 9. This is massive problem, especially because until there were Caucasian people going missing, it wasn't a problem. Back to the victims. Tamara Chipman was known to be feisty and fiery, unafraid of backing down in any situation or with any person. She gave birth to her son when she was 19, and it was at this time that she began to struggle with her mental health. Her mother believed, but it was not confirmed, that Tamara had turned to drugs. She had just had a baby, and her parents had just split up. She would try to spend her time between the two places and not have either parent feel left out. She was really just trying to make it work. She wanted to be with her family and have them both know that she still loved them. When Tamara's car broke down, she chose to hitchhike from her mom's home in Prince Rupert to her father's in Terrace, both of which in BC. She disappeared September 21st, 2005. She was last seen on the infamous Highway of Tears, Highway 16, as she hitchhiked from the Prince Rupert area, presumably to go home to her hometown in Morristown, First Nation. She had a court date for assault, but when she didn't show, people began talking and saying that it was because she was trying to avoid being sentenced. People talk. People just talk and talk and talk. She wasn't reported missing until November because her father was a fisherman. He was gone for long periods of time, and when he was back, he just assumed Tamara was with her mom, and her mom just assumed she was with her dad. There's some really big yikes energy with that one. Try and communicate. If you're split up and your kid, you haven't seen your kid, you can't contact them. Just just try and contact the other parent. I don't care what kind of relationship you have with that other parent. If your kid is there and you think there's something wrong, try. Because even though it wasn't uncommon for there to be long stretches without hearing from Tamara or Tamara, um... She was missing, and it didn't, it didn't phase them until it was too late. Do not let this be your loved ones.
And then 14-year-old Isla Sarek Auger was last seen by her family on February 2nd, 2006 in Prince George. She and her sister Audrey were out drinking together when the pair got separated. Her sister thought she would see Isla when she got home, and when her sister never arrived home, deep panic went through Audrey, and she instantly called the authorities. The family was initially told to wait 78 hours to make sure their daughter wouldn't show up on her own, and the family did. They waited four days, which they waited with bated breath, hoping that their daughter would walk through the door, praying that their daughter would come back. But on the fourth day, when she didn't, they filed the missing persons report. Her remains were recovered on February 10th, laying in a ditch 15 kilometers east of her hometown. She'd been killed by blunt force trauma to the head and was only wearing a necklace given to her by Audrey, which helped with the um, identification of the body. Audrey would end up fighting to find justice for her sister, and every year she would walk what she called the Highway of Hope in honor of her sister to try and bring attention to her sister and the other missing women and the ongoing investigations. Unfortunately, Highway 16 would take Audrey as well when she was hit by a car on one of these very walks. In response to the commonalities between Alicia, Germain, uh, Roxanne, Thiara, and Ramona Wilson, the RCMP launched Project Epona. I'm sure you guys heard me mention it while I was mentioning the victims. Project Epona, the name is based on the Inuit spirit goddess that looks after the souls just before they meet the creator and are reincarnated, which is a little fun fact that I thought was really cool. I really appreciate that they put at least a little thought into the file name. So there are three commonalities that allow uh, the connection to be made to the Epona case and allow it to be entered into the file. These three commonality are one, the woman involved had to be doing a high risk activity such as hitchhiking or prostitution. Two, the body had to be found within one mile of Highway 16, Highway 5, and Highway 97. And three, they're women. There's a lot of speculation on why there's such a high rate of indigenous women being murdered on this highway. To be honest, it could be because there are 23 band lands or as a lot of people call them reservations connected to Highway 16 itself. The area is stricken with poverty and at the time until 2017, there was no public transportation, none at all. So if there's poverty, there's no cars, no insurance. There's no bus, no public transportation, so no taxis because you can't afford the taxis. What are you gonna do if you can't work on the band land, if you have to go down the highway into one of the neighboring towns to work? You have to hitchhike. What if you wanna visit your family like a lot of these teenage girls were doing? You hitchhike. It took until 2017, again, 2017, to get one bus line down Highway 16. That's fucking crazy. They don't care. It's still a fight today to bring justice to a lot of these women and a lot of these people going missing. I really hope that it's the fact that there's just so many band lands on the highway and that's why the numbers are so askew. I hope there aren't people out there targeting women, um, indigenous women, but I wouldn't be surprised. People are sick. People are gross. I don't want to say people are gross, but people are fucked up. There are some pretty messy things in this world, and that's what this podcast is about. Uh, yeah, it's it's sad and it's scary. There was a symposium in 2006 to try and discuss with the women of BC how to stay safe on the highways. This symposium had 500 in attendance and it covered victim prevention, victim family support, emergency readiness, and community development. 
There are programs for women to join and learn how to stay safe while traveling and how to stay safe on the highways in particular. Uh, there's a lot of indigenous programs, particularly because of the poverty in indigenous bandlands, which I have to at least put out some appreciation for. They're putting some effort in. But despite this amount of effort, there's still women continuing to disappear. What I've spoken about so far is only the official number, and to be honest, that number is widely debated around BC. A lot of people believe that the number could be closer to 30, just for the years given in the file, and only for this particular stretch of highway. Another woman named Immaculate, or Mackie Basil, disappeared on June 14, 2014. She disappeared along the highway near Fort St. James. While she has not been officially added into the Epona file, she is commonly included in the discussion on the Highway of Tears. She is one of the most recent victims, and I want to include her as well, because I think her name should be thrown out there as much as we can. They never found her remains, and in 2016, her brother went to the chief of their band and asked that they put $20,000 towards a reward for information on the case. Peter Basil's pleas were granted and the reward money was put out, but it's led to nothing. No one's come forward. There's been no information. She was said to be a caring, beautiful woman. She disappeared when she was 26 and she left behind a five-year-old son. Please, if you know anything, reach out to the local authorities. I will leave a number to BC Crime Stoppers at the end of this as well. Now, as residents travel down the highway, they can be met with bright yellow billboards lining the sides warning girls not to hitchhike because there's a killer on the loose. The faces of the women and girls whose deaths still go unsolved plastered every few kilometers in hopes of reminding girls to stay safe so that they don't meet the same fate and to try and remind people that they can still come forward. They can still come help the people who have not been helped yet. These girls should not be forgotten by the public, and they won't be. These are only the atrocities committed against women on the Highway of Tears. These are only the confirmed, horrendous monstrosities confirmed on the Highway of Tears. It is estimated by the Crown Indigenous Relations of Canada that there are over 1,200 missing Indigenous women across the country. I don't want to discount the women lost who were not Indigenous, but it can't be ignored how much higher the number is. Indigenous women are proven to be five times more likely to experience violence than any other group in Canada. The Indigenous population only makes up 4.3% of Canada, but 16% of female homicide cases are Indigenous, and so are 11% of missing persons cases. This is fucking outrageous, and something that needs to be seen, and something that needs to be worked on. Part of this problem could be the general fetishization of the Indigenous women. Much like how Asian women suffer from the now-named yellow fever, Indigenous women suffer from sexualization as well. 80% of Indigenous women in the U.S. report that they have had experiences of sexual violence. If this is right beside us in the USA, imagine how bad it is here too. These women through history have been treated as less than and are just sexual objects. When people realize how effective the highway was to murder, the victim base expanded. That's what I think happened. People were seeing that people were getting away with murdering these women and they were able to hide the bodies and get away on a very quick stretch and it was effective and no one was seeing it and it worked. So when they were able to kill the indigenous women, why not go for a harder prey? Why not go for it? It worked. It's not one killer on the highways. It's not just two, as we've seen. Two is just the minimum for the highway of tears. It's a long list of people who have been targeting women in some of the most vulnerable positions of their lives. 
hitchhiking, some high on drugs, some just trying to get home when they didn't have another way there. These women do not deserve to be forgotten, and we cannot let any of them fall to the wayside. Each of them were incredibly loved, and each of them still have families fighting for justice, if not for their own family, but for the other women on the highway. So please, if you have any information that could help with the named cases, or really any open cases in BC, visit bccrimestoppers.com or call 1-800-222-8477. You can leave an anonymous tip at either of these 24-7-365. Let's work together to help these victims and their families. So again, that's bccrimestoppers.com or call 1-800-222-8477. If you or anyone else are suffering from violence, please reach out for help at your local helplines. You can find your province-specific ones at www.dawncanada.net forward slash issues forward slash crisis dash hotlines forward slash. Again, www.dawncanada.net forward slash issues forward slash crisis dash hotlines forward slash. This website is a directory of all of the abuse based hotlines that you could possibly need in Canada and it's listed by province and it's really awesome. I would highly recommend it. If you or someone you know is suffering from a mental health crisis or needs someone to talk to, you could dial 833-456-4566 for the Canadian Suicide Prevention Hotline. They are open 24-7, 365 a year, and if you feel it's more severe, please dial 911 or visit your local emergency room. Again, 833-456-4566. And for my American viewers, your hotline is 1-800-273-8255. They are also open 24-7, 365. And if you feel it's more severe, please dial 911 or visit your local emergency room. Again, 1-800-273-8255. You are worth so much. You deserve all of the help that you can possibly get. Please reach out if you need it. You deserve even the help you do not feel you deserve. You can find me on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube, all at Whispers in the Trees. Thank you so much for your continued support. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much, and thank you for listening. Stay safe out there.